Let's begin formally. Tonight is Wednesday night, May the 15th, 2013. This is our first meeting of Management 3025 for the summer term. My name is Roger Strickland and I will be your guide, the bane of your existence, whatever, okay? We had just discussed for a second what should be the penalty in a classroom setting for a student whose cell phone goes off. And someone said, kick them out. And that would set a good example. And that prompted me to write on the board, pour encourager les autres. Anybody here speak enough French to translate that? Pour encourager les autres. To encourage the others. To set an example for others. Now there's another fellow. I'm going to use the more traditional spelling of his name. So uh, lately anymore they spell it Zidane. Mud Zidane. He had a different way of saying that. If you have someone who is not behaving properly, his motto was, shoot one, teach a hundred. <laughs> yeah, Chairman Mao. Yeah. And so you can think about that as one perspective on management, you know. And uh, I teach economics quite a bit. I've been teaching economics all the entire time I've been at Santa Fe. Economics is all about incentives. Negative incentives and positive incentives. Do negative incentives work? It, it, if the price is high enough. You know? If your cell phone goes off, I will shoot you. No cell phones would go off. Pretty easy. Is it reasonable? Of course not. There is at least one class on this campus that had, and I don't know if it still does, had the policy that if your cell phone goes off during class, you fail the course. Wow. I'm, I'm just, you know, a little, little philosophical debate there. If you are a manager and you've got seven or ten subordinates and you are meeting down with them every couple, meeting with them every couple of weeks, and every time you sit down to have a meeting, this phone goes off and that phone goes off. And, that phone, and that guy's over text over the text in, and what would you do? And it's not just what would you do. That's what I, one of the biggest points I want to drive through during this whole course. It's not what you do that makes the biggest difference. It's how you do it, how you convey it, how you treat people, that will make a difference in whether or not you're going to be effective or not. If I threaten to fail anybody whose phone goes off, well, maybe that'll stop the phones from going off. I'm not sure that's going to engender a lot of interest or class attendance. So, I have <clears throat> in my written communication to you on Canvas encouraged you to come to class. And for those that are not here tonight, I want to encourage them to come to class. And I want to speak for just a few minutes on the program and these optional classes. Many of them. What do you think is the comparable value of an online degree versus a degree where you attend class on a regular basis? Are those equivalent in the eyes of an employer? I think it's based on where the school is. Suppose it's the same school. Then no. It's the same. It's the same? Right, but Phoenix online has not got the reputation that Santa Fe has. Right. But suppose you could go to the University of Florida and you could either do their online program or their in-class program. Would one degree have greater uh, value to an employer than another? Yes. You think so? How? I don't think so. I believe that the online degree would have less of value depending on certain employers. Like Why? More, for lack of a better term, more old school employers who are not like not used to there being online degrees available would probably look at a more brick and mortar degree that would be carrying more clout. Okay. That's my question. But question is how would they know if it's an online degree? Let's assume online? they're going to know. That would, if you good, come, that's if, a good point. If, if you, you make application to me, I'm going to want to know what kind of degree you got. Okay. I think any reasonable employer is going to do the same thing. And are you going to be in a, at a disadvantage if you say, well, it was an online program? You had a comment, ma'am. Yeah, uh, due to attendance. I mean, I'm sorry? Attendance, for example, when you 
you go to school for, you know, you have a, a school schedule, you're supposed to, like, what you're supposed to be here at 5.30 on Wednesday, well, that means that if we completed an entire uh, degree, that means that we're reliable, we're responsible, we made it to at least all the classes that we needed to Make it in order for us okay, it would it would be an indicator that you're at least self-disciplined enough to get, get to most of the classes. On the other hand, you could say, well, I took an online degree, but I was working full time, and I had the self-discipline to do all the coursework and stay up with it. So you have counter arguments. I think we're transitioning transitioning currently into more online degrees. Mm -hmm. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know yet. I work for the PA school. There's no way they can do an online degree. I, I sure hope not. Right, there are schools <laughs> offering it. I have no idea a physician's assistant with an online degree. <laughs> you want that person right. giving you a physical exam? No. That scares the hell out of me. Yeah. Okay, and maybe I'm old school. Okay. Now I, I am I am clearly old school. I have a bias. I think that an online degree, if it's purely online, puts you in, in my opinion, a disadvantage. But what if you're a programmer? There are going to be exceptions. When you have a degree in a technical area like that then what you learn was what you learned in the book or on the videos or however you learned it. That may, that may work. May. <clears throat> My question, though, when I hire you is going to be how well are you, do I expect that you will be able to perform in this job? And your performance in that job is going to be to one degree or another and typically more. How well do you work with people? And if you tell me you got your degree by sitting in your office at home for four years or five years and doing all these courses, I'm, for me, immediately the radar goes up and, and I get suspect. I want to know more about you and I want some evidence that you deal well with people. Now that's just an online degree, okay? And if it's just a technical online degree, I take your point, some of the online programs are absolutely superb. But if it's a degree that involves some kind of interaction among individuals. Maybe a management degree. If you've got a management degree that you did all your coursework online, what do I have as evidence that you know how to manage anything bigger than a lemonade stand that you run by yourself? The answer is not a hell of a lot. And you're asking me to invest $50,000, $80,000 that first year in your salary, benefits, and training based on that. I'm a little bit uh, nervous about that as an employer. So what we have done in this program, the SOM program at Santa Fe, is we have asked and are gently requiring every instructor to hold classes that students can come to. Now they will be optional because some students live a distance. I have a student this term living out in Las Vegas. Yeah, I told her she could miss every third class. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what I'm, you know, when we started this program, I had no requirement to give night classes. And I've been doing it for four years over in the health services program, voluntarily. Because I think you get a better deal if you come to class I get a better connection with you. I think I can teach better that way. But most of all, I think when you finish the program, you can walk out and say, well, it was technically an online degree, but in fact, all of my classes were hybrid. We met on a regular basis. And I think that's a hell of a lot stronger statement about the value of that degree than to say, well, all I did was take tests on the computers for four years. So that's my argument, and I'm preaching to the choir in the classroom, but I'm certainly trying to reach the rest on video. That's why I think you ought to be here, so that in a job interview, the, the interviewer can say, so this is an online degree, and you can say, well, no, not quite. All of our classes were hybrid. I attended classes regularly. I know several of my instructors personally. Uh, we would go out for a beer once in a while after class. I worked with my classmates in the classroom. We did a lot of social, uh, interpersonal activities. That's a whole lot different than a typical online degree, and I think you got some bragging rights there. So that's why I hold classes. That's why I hope you'll show up. That's why I'm going to do my best to try to make them entertaining and informative for you. And I'm going to ask you to get involved in the conversations as we go along. Okay? That's what it's all about. And so into the first part of the sermon. What else is going on? Let's talk mechanics and logistics. 
How do you like Canvas? Anybody like it, don't like it? It's better than Angel. <laughs> it's like better than Angel? I like how everything is just right there as soon as you come in. Yeah. Right? Like all your assignments are right there. You just click on assignments and it tells you what it is. How many classes are you taking? I have two right now. And they're both well organized on Canvas? Mm -hmm. See, when they set Canvas up, they didn't give us instruction on how to use it. And every instructor basically went out and reinvented his own wheel. <laughs> and so you're going to find as you take courses with different instructors, they're going to use Canvas a different way. Hopefully they will coalesce into a fairly comfortable common format. But particularly this first term or two, there's going to be a lot of differences, and we're still working the bugs out too. Example, when I finish to class tonight, tomorrow anyway, I'll be uh, uploading this video to YouTube and then trying to figure out how the hell to post it to Canvas, because I don't know. You have to go to the third-party like the, the third party things on the bottom? Uh, I don't know. I don't know whether I'm going to do it that way. I, I've, I've taken all my other old YouTubes from my economics classes, and I just load those right in the course schedule as one of the pages. But I'm going to figure it out. And in trying to figure it out, guess who's going to screw it up? You could probably just copy the URL and do attachment. That's, that's a good theory. <laughs> that will be the easiest. It might work. That's on the assumption I did it correctly. <laughs> right? So, um, has anyone had any difficulty accessing Canvas and the assignments and how to submit the assignments? Has anybody submitted that first writing assignment. When is that first writing assignment due? Tomorrow morning at 8. Tomorrow morning at 8, eight, eight, eight o'clock. Now, how do you do that? You say go to assignment. You go, well, I should have given you more preface to that. If you go to modules, start with modules. That's where all the information is. Modules. And under modules, the first one is called administrative documents. And when you click, click that and it's a drop down, it shows you the syllabus and the course schedule, what we're doing week by week and what the assigned chapters are. And there's a biographical sketch of me in there in case you want to know a little more about me or something model your biographical sketch on. Below that, <clears throat> there is a, another module called um, Demonstrated Competencies. which I will refer to as the DCs. There's another module called Writing Assignments, which in my very creative way I will call WAs. And what you want to do is go to Writing Assignments, open it up, and you'll see the first writing assignment, it'll say something like WA1, Writing Assignment 1, with errors. And this is a, a sample writing assignment, um, sort of turned in by a student, I elaborated on parts of it, that is just a miserable failure. And it shows you some of the errors that I note, because I go through and I, I grade you like an English comp teacher. Okay? So this is to be read first with a big warning sign, don't do this. And then when you open up WA1, that's the first one, that's the one that's due Thursday, tomorrow morning, and do the best you can to get it in by 8. I know we're working through some glitches. Open it up, see what you got to do, and write your paper. Once you write your paper, then go to Assignments, open up WA1, and there will be a box that says Submit Assignment. You click on that, and then it's like attaching a, a, an attachment to an email. It's that easy. But we can attach it through Word, too, right? You can write it in Word. Uh -huh. But once you have the document, my autobiographical sketch, save it on the desktop, open up assignments, my assignment, and it'll say browse. <clears throat> browse till you find it, click on it. You can even add a little comment. Strickland, you suck. Okay, cool. Just remember that won't be anonymous. That probably won't do you much good. But, okay? But that's the way the system works. And, and so for the term, as it is configured currently, as I recall, there are six competencies and five writing assignments. We began this program last fall. Last fall, there were 20 writing assignments, not five. And there were 10 competencies, not six. So I have compressed some stuff and have scaled it down and taken some stuff out. It's still going to be a very full term to get all that stuff done on schedule. 
Every assignment, a competency or a writing assignment, everyone has a due date. Now I'm going to give you some slack on this first one because I know we're working out the bugs. But you've got to turn them all in and anything that comes in late gets half credit. Why? What's my point? What you're going to find is these are not terribly intellectually difficult, academically challenging issues. A lot of this is writing about what do you think about this. Find me some references online and tell me about that. Not, not overwhelming. It's not like you're going to do calculus in the dark with no flashlight, okay? <laughs> but where you will get in trouble is if you cannot organize and discipline yourself to stay on schedule. And as far as I'm concerned, that's one of the major tests of management. Can you manage yourself? If you cannot manage yourself, what the hell are you doing thinking you're going to manage other people? More on that in a minute. So this is not academically so challenging, but it is personally challenging in a very managerial sense. Okay? Now, in addition to these writing assignments, <clears throat> and I've forgotten the breakdown. Let's see. Six competencies, I think, at 30. Um, five of these at 20. I think it was seven DCs. I think you're right. I did add a seven. So let's make that 210. And let's make that 100. And then there are two exams. I think it's 75 apiece, right? Does that sound right? 150? What's that give me? 460? Eh, maybe. That's about how many points there are to the course. Now, let me tell you something about the exams. They're right here in this room on schedule on Wednesday evenings. Two exams, a midterm and a final. Almost the entire exam is multiple choice. Right out of the two textbooks. You have a Kinnicky textbook on management, and you have, and I don't have my Kinnicky with me, but you have the Caproni textbook, which is a more self-reflective book, and you have study questions for it. For the Kinnicky text, I have given you a couple of hundred multiple choice questions on the first eight chapters, and I will take from those questions to create the exam. So you've got all the questions that are going to be on the exam in advance. You don't have the answers. You've got to go find them. Now, if you've got the uh, questions six weeks before the test, and you can't score 90% correct, what's up? That's my standard. So all of this is imminently doable if you are disciplined, focused, organized, and you have a bias towards action. So my intention right now is to say 460 points, 90% is an A, 80% is a B, and so forth. Okay? Now, I, again, I'm preaching to the choir. The fact that you came to class tonight indicates you are definitely engaged in the course. Last, cor last term, I had 94 students that began the course. Seven of them were incompletes from the term before. But of that 94, I had 49 people make a C or better for the course. The great majority of them just dropped out along the way. In some cases, they were poorly organized and not disciplined. In other cases, they had overloaded themselves with too many classes and, and, and balanced that with a very complicated life in terms of family, job, etc. Well, welcome to management, right? You've got to manage yourself. One of, the, one of the big sins I've seen cr committed is, oh, gee, I've got a full-time job, I've got six kids, but if I enroll for four courses full-time, I get all this financial aid. Hoo-yah! And then everything goes down the tubes. That's a prescription for not just failing this course, but for failing the program, disappointing your family, and probably falling down on the job. So we've got to balance what we're going to do in a realistic manner, and you've got to be working in a, on a schedule You've got to be living three, five, seven days in advance at least. Okay? That's management. All right? That's the end of the second part of the sermon. I will pause now and invite questions, commentary, ridicule. Hell, I'll take that. Where were the questions in that book again? Where were the questions in what? In the Kaniki book. Those study questions are on Canvas. Mm. I think they're in a separate module. And you'll see them. Study questions one through eight. First bank, second bank. And then there's another set for the, for the final exam. Mm -hmm. And there are study questions for Caproni in that same module. Mm -hmm. And if you can't find them for any reason, let me know. I try to check my email every day. I'm trying to be getting back to you within 24 hours of any kind of inquiry.
Okay, so the midterm is going to be based off of... The midterm is going to be based off the Kanicki text or the Caproni text. Okay. Multiple choice discussion, and there may be a, some additional questions that I feel like asking. <laughs> Anything we cover in this class that will be posted to, on video is fair game on an exam. I might, for example, say, pour encourager les autres, comment. Comment doesn't just mean, though, to translate. Comment means to explain. What's the context of this? What is it is in reference to? So, that's where we're going. Anything else on your mind? What exactly are the, the competencies? Like, where do, where do those come from? Like, where do you the competencies are, are like the Caproni book. The Caproni book really makes you take a reflective look at yourself. Uh -huh. The competencies do a lot of the same thing. Okay. One of the competencies is to build a SWOT analysis on yourself. SWOT, your strengths, weaknesses internally, and the opportunities and threats that you face externally with regard to your intended career. Let's say over the next five, six years. I'm going to ask you to list those out in great detail, and from those construct a series of strategies, directions you can pursue that will help you get where you want to go. If you can do that for you, you understand the principle of doing it for your organization, your company, your department, etc. Okay? There's a SWOT analysis, there's a networking uh, competency. You know, how many people do you know? How many people do you know in what categories and of what value are they to you? What can you do to grow your network? What can you do to nurture your network of people? Sometimes people like to say, well, yeah, that's right. It's, it's not what you, what you know, it's who you know. And if you believe that, I've got a bridge out in Arizona over this beautiful lake. I'll be glad to sell you. Mm -hmm. It's not just what you can do and who you know, right? But they can open doors for you. So the competencies are geared more in that line. One of the competencies is a competency on um, calculations, little mathematical applications for business and finance. So you're going to find that you, uh, you will make good use of a financial calculator. Now I suggest the Texas Instruments Business Analyst too. I know that uh, Mr. Oliveira, who teaches the finance course, will use it. I have taught the finance and the managerial econ course. I use it in those courses. I'm going to use it in this course in the end. So on the, on the final exam, you'll need to do those calculations. Your O and T stands for what? You have strength, weaknesses? Opportunities and threats. And what's the name of the calculator? The Texas Instruments TI Business Analyst BA 2. Or 2 something, I don't know. But Walmart $30 or iPhone app $15. Since I used to lose one per year, I'm already ahead. Okay? So, anything else on your mind? i got a couple of other topics to cover. Nothing real heavy, you know. So what is management? We are allowed in class discussion something called WAGs, a WAG, a W-A-G. That stands for a wild ass guess. <laughs> so you're entitled to a WAG. What would you say or define management to be? Supervising somebody. Supervising people. Okay. Anything else? Controlling budget. Controlling budgets. Planning. Planning for the future of the business. Planning, meaning anticipating the future. Putting your putting your company's plan and motto in action. Planning without execution is just an exercise in futility. So not just planning, but even being able to execute. Maintaining. Say again? Maintaining the uh, like a homeostasis in the yeah, yeah. Get it up and running and keep it running and adjust it as necessary. 
Okay. Let me suggest this. Planning is, to, uh, planning management is, uh, to a large degree, getting things done through other people. It's not what can you do by yourself. It's what you can. What can you do to influence and direct and encourage and motivate other people to give their best effort? Let's introduce a term, one you will see in the future as well. The term is called discretionary effort. What does discretionary mean? Hmm? You ever heard the term discretionary income? So That's the, go ahead. Politically correct word of getting people to do what you want them to do. Well, dis discretionary income is the money you have left after you've paid your bills, if that happens to exist. That's the money you get to decide what to do with. To use your discretion is to use your judgment, okay? and to take action based on what you think you should do. So if that's true, then what would discretionary effort be? How often you act. How often you act? You're kind of circling real close around what I'm trying to get you to say. Discretionary effort. Where I work, my, um, my boss doesn't really carry your methodology. He just wants to see the result. Okay. He leaves it up to you as to how you achieve that, and um, the people are very good if you have questions mm -hmm. as to how to do something. I have yet to meet anybody who's been upset when I've asked them a question that maybe wasn't within their realm of knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good. Sounds so, like a real positive attitude place. It is. I'm That's very great. shocked, actually. Yeah, yeah it's uh, altogether rare. Yeah, how often you do it and how well they work? Mm -hmm. how Pretty close. Work? Let, me, let, me, let me contrast this. And this is, this is my personal definition, but I've seen it used elsewhere. A satisficer. What is a satisfier, satisficer type of employee? An employee who actually tries to satisfy the boss. He does the bare minimum. Yeah. Good. He does exactly as much as necessary to get by, to satisfy, but not exceed. Okay. So discretionary effort would be any effort above and beyond what you have your Perfect. normal job duties? Discretionary effort would be work above and beyond what is absolutely necessary. Okay? And so you're in my job in management, and in fact my job in teaching, is to try to bring forth from you that discretionary effort, that willingness to do more than simply what is asked of you. The good news is if you cultivate that habit, and you, you build your own standard of excellence, and this is the caliber of work I'm going to do, you will soon find you have very little competition because the world is full of satisficers. Uh, I liken them to the idea that uh, sometimes I think if you put a cowbell around your... You know what a cowbell does? What's a cowbell for? It's let you know where the cows are. Why do you put a cowbell on, on, uh, around the neck of one of your steers or whatever? It's one that wanders off. So, when it goes where you want it to go, the rest of the herd will follow it. You take the best steer you've got that knows his way around the water and holes and the feeding troughs and everything, you put the cowbell on him, and as long as you can get him to go over with you to the feeding area, the rest of the herd will just follow. Mm -hmm. And so my theory is that if you put a cowbell around your neck and walk across the campus of most college and university campuses in the world today, within 200 yards you will have a huge crowd following you because they have no idea where they're going. Those are your satisficers. And those are, in a sense, your competition. And so if your standards are set above that, if you are, in fact, displaying discretionary effort in everything you can do, you will limit the competition that you face. And your work will speak for you. Okay? So think about that throughout not just this course and your assignments, but throughout this program. One of the things you're going to do at the very end of this course, uh, competency about number five, is you're going to write a letter for me to sign. A letter of recommendation on you. It's going to be as though you said, Strickland, would you, uh, let's don't say that, Mr. Strickland, we will use titles. Mr. Strickland, would you write me a letter of recommendation for this scholarship? Sure, you, write, you put it together and if I like it, I'll sign it. And think now, well before that fact, 
12, 15 weeks before that fact. What are you going to be doing throughout the term that I would recognize and be able to elaborate on sincerely in writing a glowing recommendation for you? That's what discretionary effort is about. It's building a standard and a track record that says I'll stand up equal to anybody you want to put me against. And I've got to tell you this, out of those 94 students, and even out of the 49 that survived, there were 15 or 20 of them that are absolutely top-rate people. There are some great folks coming through this program. So get your standards up there. If you can say, I made it to every class, I think that's a positive thing. If you can say at the end of the second or third or fourth week that I know you by first name and we've chatted occasionally, or we've corresponded occasionally, that's a good thing. You're working both on your relationship skills, your network, your visibility. Okay? So this entire course is an exercise in management. And for the most part, it's an exercise in the management of you. Now, another little paradigm they use in, in management, very basic. They talk about, <clears throat> traditionally they talk about the four managerial functions, and we'll, we'll do that first. Planning, organizing, I'm going to put the old school word, directing and controlling the four things a manager does. This is real old school. Some folks say, well, that's not anywhere close to a complete definition of everything people do. But it's a pretty good little takeoff point. Plan. Plan is, as you said, to look at the future. If you're not living in the future, it will come up and bite you in the butt before you know it. Right? So you've got to live in the future. One of the ways we live in the future, and some of you saw it on, on Canvas, is we remember Murphy's Law. Whatever can go wrong is going to go wrong, usually at the very worst time. Which means if, a, if an assignment is due on a Friday, when is your goal to have it finished? Tuesday at the latest, preferably Monday, preferably even during the weekend. Finish it up Sunday night. Why? Because if it's due at midnight on Friday, what's going to happen somewhere around 10 o'clock that night? Your computer Your computer's going to quit. The Internet's going to quit. Canvas is going to quit. And you think I'm going to believe you, okay? Sure. So planning is anticipating. Uh, how many of you use a personal planner or scheduler or calendar on an iPhone, anything like that? I don't know how you live if you don't do that. If you don't have some way to represent your commitments in the future. Personally, I use Google Calendar, and it just gets, gets filled up. And if I forget to put it on Google Calendar, too many times I forget it completely. If you don't pick up that course schedule, and plug in those dates and those due dates for every assignment, you're committing academic suicide. And like a boss, and I'm going to treat you like I would a new subordinate manager, I'm not really interested in how hard you swung at the ball. I'm not interested in how hard you tried. You did it or you didn't do it. If I tell you we have a client coming in two weeks from Friday and I want you ready to give him a 45-minute presentation on what we're doing for his company, when he comes in on Friday, how many tries do you get? One. There are no do-overs. Okay? Well, welcome to management. Organize. That's getting organized. Plan and organize. Organize includes not just how you're going to get things done, but staffing. In other words, making sure you've got all the resources you need. Resources means money, time, people, uh, information or knowledge, etc., 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 etc. Physical meeting places. A number of folks in this course over the last two terms have coalesced into little study groups. They meet in the library. There are rooms you can reserve to meet and sit down and talk through stuff and work through stuff. Um, make sure you got all the resources you need know how to use them. You have control over them. And whatever other organization you, you need, this may include, for example, logistics. That is the, the movement of people and materiel to the right time at the right place. 
if you have a concern about transportation, if you know in advance that you are going to miss such and such, what are you going to do to make up for that? Directing is the term they used to use. Most of the time now they've changed that. They say leading. You must lead others. You must engage them and get their willing, discretionary effort. And can you do that in a class? As a student in a classroom, can you display this skill? Yes. How? Lead a group. How? Give me specifics. What would you do? Be the group spokesperson or the leader or leader of the group. How do you become the leader of the group? <clears throat> By being the person that sets everything up pretty much. Okay. Like Stepping up. Well, starting Take yourself. charge. Step it up. Taking charge. Yeah. It's the person who goes home tonight or stays right here before class. I'll tell you another story in a second. Who, who creates study groups. Or goes home and puts something on the discussion forum that says, I want to start a study group. We're going to meet Tuesday afternoons at 3 o'clock or Saturday mornings at 2 o'clock. Okay, bingo, now you're the leader. At least as far as you want to go. And can you get people to cooperatively engage and support that? Many years ago, I had a student in class. And it was a day class. We met three days a week. And it was on a Friday just before our first exam on Monday. And we had finished reviewing the material in class that day. And we were just wrapping up. And I said, well, is there anything else? And this fellow sitting out there, and he says, may I make an announcement to the class? Yeah, go ahead. And he walked up to the board, and he said, my name's John Spence. That's about how he writes. He says, this is my phone number. And this is my address, and here's a map to my house. At 6 o'clock tonight, I'm going to start a study group to get ready for this test on Monday. I'm going to have some beer and I'm going to have some chips. If you want to bring some soft drinks, anybody that wants to, you're welcome. Thank you. And he sat down. You ever seen anybody do that in a class before? I hadn't. Not that way. I thought, this guy knows how to pick up women. <laughs> Well, John came to class Monday with about five other students, and they were laughing, talking, having the best time. They came in, sat down, took the exam, and that core group of students set the curve. And John did that on every exam in that class, the next class, and a third class that he took with me. John Spence. You're going to hear his name again. John Spence went on to graduate from Santa Fe, went on to the University of Florida, graduated from Florida as number three in the nation in public relations that year. But that's not the half of his story. John, while he was at the University of Florida, he and I got to be friends and stayed in touch. I asked him while he was over, I said, John, what are you going to do with a degree in public relations? He said, I've been thinking about it. He says, uh, I'm from Miami. My mom's got a charter fishing boat that I've worked on all my life. He says, I love to fish. I want to get a job in public relations in the fishing industry. I want to go out on great big boats and catch sailfish and marlin, rub elbows with rich people. And when we get through fishing for the day, I want to sit on the beach and have a rum drink served by a pretty girl. And I want to do that as a public relations director. And I thought, son, you need to stop smoking that stuff. That's just not very realistic at all. Well, in the early part of his senior year, I ran into John and said, so how are you doing on your fishing thing for public relations? He said, I'm doing pretty good. He says, did you know? He said, did you know that Florida is a peninsula? I'm thinking they give you a hell of a good education down the road there, don't they? He said, yeah, John, we heard rumors about that. He said, no, you're missing the point. He says, here we are in Gainesville. He says, there's a fishing tournament, several of them, all along the coasts of Florida every single weekend. He says, what I do is I drive over where I know there's going to be a fishing tournament. I get there Friday afternoon about 3 o'clock when everybody's bringing their boats in. I go over and introduce myself and ask to meet the tournament director. They direct me to him. I shake hands, introduce myself, and say, I love fishing and I'm here to volunteer. And they put me to work. I'm chipping ice, I'm working on boats, I'm cutting bait, I'm fixing fishing rods. The guy's a whiz. He's got incredible people skills. He says, inevitably, Saturday morning when the tournament starts, somebody says, hey, John, why don't you ride with us today? You're not allowed to fish, but you can ride the boat for us. And so I spend the day with three or four fishermen out there trying to catch fish. And I get to be pretty good friends with him. Well, he won't tell you the full truth, but he, he's the best fisherman I've ever met. I wouldn't doubt that he's helped a few people win some tournaments. 
He says, same thing happens on Sunday. And so when I come home Sunday evening, I've got the names, the business cards, and the relationship with six or eight people who fish in big tournaments off big boats. He, says, he did this for several weeks, several months. And at the end of the time when he was looking at graduation, he sent out a letter to, to six of these guys. What kind of people were they? CEOs. Very influential. He said, I'm John, you know me, we've met at several tournaments, you know my work ethic, you know my people skills, and I'm graduating the number three PR student in America. I'm looking for a job in the maritime fishing industry and public relations. If you know anybody you think would use me well, could use me, let me know. And a few weeks later, the phone rang, and the man on the other end said, Mr. Spence? He said, yes. And the guy says, my name is Winthrop Rockefeller, former governor of Arkansas. I don't know if you know the name. He says, we have a Rockefeller Foundation down in Miami called the Billfish Foundation, which is a nonprofit that raises money for research into sport fishing, and we need a public relations director. I'm holding your resume. Would you like to interview for the job? John went down, interviewed for the job, and before he went, he wrote up an entire marketing plan for him did incredible research, walked into the job interview, laid it all out, offered him the job. For two years, he was their public relations director. At the third year, their director, the executive director, quit or was fired, and they promoted John above everybody else right up to the top. He ran a Rockefeller Foundation for three years. He doubled its revenues two years in a row. One of the most upcoming CEOs in America, young CEOs. From there, he transitioned into consulting and training, which is what he does extensively today throughout Fortune 500 companies around the world. He just came back from uh, several weeks out in Australia and New Zealand. John was a student here at Santa Fe. He also did a commencement speech in 2010. Yes, he did a commencement speech in 2010. He did a TEDx speech, if you're familiar with the TED speeches. My point is, John knew how to plan, organize, and lead. He set up study groups just like that. And he had more fun and made better grades than anybody I've seen go through college. That's management. That's leadership. And knock on wood, wherever it is, hopefully we're going to get John in to talk to us this term because he still lives right out on 241. Okay? So that's what it's about. Plan, organize, lead. Yes, you can lead. And directing, what does directing mean? Well, directing, leading, the third, the fourth one, controlling. Controlling is monitoring what's going on and taking action when things get out of whack before they get real bad. Delegating is a, is a part of leading. As your leader, I'm occasionally going to say, I need you to do this, you to do that, and you to do the other. You've got to be able to delegate, and more about that as we go along, because we don't want to be in the position of doing everything ourselves. Okay? So you can do everything in management in this course in terms of the general skills that I'm talking about if you put yourself to it. Set your standards high. All right, that's the third part of the sermon. Anything else? One of your demonstrated competencies is to make a video of yourself. I may ask you to do additional videos throughout the term. But the one I definitely want is one where you are going to sit down in professional attire, in a semi-professional setting, and you're going to speak to the camera and say, Hi, my name is such and such. I'm a student in the SOM program. Here's a little background on me, and here's why I'm taking the program and what I intend to do. Ten minutes. How long, how long is ten minutes when you're making a video? How long is that? Seventeen days. <laughs> I had one student the first term. I believe she shot 65 takes before she got it where she wanted it. Okay. How and perfect do you want it? It's your video. It's your standards. If I were your boss, how good would you make it? There is no substitute for discretionary effort. What if you don't know how to make a video? Welcome to management. Management is getting things done and it's solving problems even when you don't have complete information. Even when you don't have complete instructions or directions. Approach it with the right attitude. Make it a challenge, not a chore. If you need some help or some thoughts on making a video, let me know. I've got a YouTube channel where I've put my economics videos and other videos from these sorts of classes. 
I've got about 180 videos on there. I've got about 420,000, 430,000 views. And these are all done with nothing but a $75 flip camera. Videos can be very important. Anybody here uh, know anything about videos as a tool in job search? In career progression? If I were going to hire someone in a managerial job, I want to screen out everybody who's not really going to make it, right? And one of the ways I do that, of course, is I say, if you haven't got a bachelor's degree, don't even apply. Is that fair? No. It's not meant to be fair. It's meant to make my workload easier. Now, once I get you past that screen, and I've got 20 of you that sound, you know, I look at your resumes, you send them, and you sound kind of decent, one of the things I'm going to do, I'm not going to fly your butt all the way up to Atlanta and back just so I can talk to you. I'm going to say, why don't you knock out about a 10 or 20 minute video and answer these questions for me. Are you ready to do that? Would you be willing to do that on a resume? Here's my resume. Here's a URL to my video on YouTube or on my website about who I am and what I'm like. I'd much rather watch your video than talk to you in person the first time. Because if you're a clown on video, I don't want to waste the time talking to you. Does that make sense? Sure it does. Where are the best jobs advertised? The best jobs in management. They're not. They're not. Why not? Because they don't want to retired people applying. Because I don't want to have to wade through a hundred different damn people to try to decide who's going to take this job. And even then it's just a crapshoot because I really don't know about them until they've been here a while. What am I going to do instead to cut down the probabilities of wasting time and money? I'm going to go to the best people that work for me. I'm going to go to the most trusted friends I have. And I'm going to say, here's what I need. Is there anyone you know personally that you would recommend? And if you recommend them, that's your reputation on the line. So I don't think you're going to send me a loser, right? Sure. So how are you going to find those jobs? You're going to network your ass off. And networking is a science as well as an art. And we're going to talk about that later on in the term too. Those are the kind of conversations I want to have here at cla in class in the evenings. Okay? I'm pretty well done for tonight. Is there anything else on your mind? Any concerns, issues? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. I don't remember. Okay. Old, short, limited memory, you know. Um, let me make one last plug. We have a student association in the SOM program called Sigma Omicron Nu. They're going to start having meetings in a couple of weeks. They're going to meet Wednesday evenings right after this class in this room. I would invite all of you at home and here. Come in and see what that organization is about. Hear what they're trying to do. They've got some good ideas, and they can offer you some more opportunities in terms of maximizing the value of this degree. Okay? Last call. Going once. Anybody? Anything? Going twice. Be careful. 23rd Avenue and 39th Avenue, going back to Gainesville, the Alachua County Sheriff's Office patrols those very regularly. Don't speed. Peace. See you next time.